This is the second in the series of the Tell Me About Civic Engagement Lectures, and we're really pleased to have one of our ex-students from the Children's and General Integration Programme. Um, I was going to say, um, uh, sorry, it's Katie Hill. What I was going to say was Katie Taylor there for a minute. <laughs> And then I was thinking, what's right? <laughs> because I think she's, Katie Taylor is a wonderful role model, which I think you are as well. So if I mix up your <laughs> names, it's not an insult. Because I think what you've done is, is far more remarkable than what she's done. So Katie um, was a student here, as I said, in the four and a half year degree program. And during that time, she won the undergraduate All-Ireland Award. Um, she's published in the British Journal um, about palliative care. And she has just returned from China, where she spent the last six months working voluntary in the Butterfly Children's Hospice, um, which I understand from Katie is where um, little children who are destitute or abandoned are left in the hospice um, to die. And that's where Katie's been working. And she's going to share her experience with us for about a half an hour, and then she'll take questions at the end. OK? Yeah. Great. So if you give her a welcome, please. <laughs> So as Carol said, I graduated this year and I've always had a passion for paediatric palliative care and in fourth year we did a module on contemporary issues for children's nursing and in that I looked at palliative care in Ireland and just what services are available here. After that module then I went on to look more at paediatric palliative care in Ireland and the UK and just seeing the differences and wrote a paper on that with Professor Imelda Coyne here in Trinity, which was published in the British Journal of Nursing. And as Carol said already, that I won the undergradu undergraduate award of Ireland and Northern Ireland for nursing and midwifery in October 2011 for the paper on palliative care. So naturally then after, after finishing up then I decided that palliative care was something that I wanted to pursue and somewhere in a hospice setting particularly. So I found this place, Butterfly Children's Hospice in China. It's the first hospice in China and the first organization that does community palliative care services. So I set off in May 2012 and went out to this place, not knowing what to expect. I went on my own and yeah, so Butterfly Children's Hospice is China's first community palliative care service for, ch for children. It opened in April 2010 by a British couple, Lynn and Alan Gould. The hospice cares for abandoned and orphaned children which have a life expectancy of less than six months. They provide love and care and treatment for these children with life-limiting or life-threatening conditions. They also provide a limited community care service to families to, in the hope that they won't have to abandon their children. However, this it's difficult to do as China Dying children in China are kind of just shunned aside and if you have a dying child it's very hard for the community to respect you so most people just find it easier to abandon them. So the community palliative care service is difficult taking off but hopefully in the future there might be some more scope to work in that kind of area. The Butterfly Children's Hospice is a non-profit organisation and relies wholly on sponsors, volunteering and donations. A total of 53 children have received care in the Butterfly Children's Hospice. 29 received end-of-life care. There's 14 currently in Butterfly Hospice. There was two new arrivals yesterday. Three have gone to long-term care homes and six have been adopted. One little girl got adopted on Monday. And one is in a foster home waiting to be adopted. He's being fostered by an American family in China, but they can't foster him because they're only 27. And in China, you have to be 30 to adopt a baby. So, Butterfly Children's Hospice is located in Changsha, which is in South Central China. When I first arrived, I was completely overwhelmed and shocked by the poverty and the struggles that people face in this country. At the beginning, I did think to myself, what have I done? Is this a huge mistake? But as soon as I stepped foot in the Butterfly home, I knew it was the right decision. The cultural differences that I faced were just unbelievable, from dealing with rats, mice, insects, everything. Here I can't even look at a spider, but there we were living with rats and everything else. So you just have to get used to it. So the 
There is a 14 bedded unit and they hope to expand 24 to 30 beds by the end of this year. One, they're called IEs, look after three butterflies. They basically do, they feed the babies, they give them 24 hour care, they wash them, they look after them. And when I was there, there was three nurses and a lead nurse. But when I went, the head nurse needed to have a break and she went home to England for three months. So she left me in charge because the two girls I worked with were Filipinos. They were lovely, but in their culture, they can't make decisions and accept responsibility. So the pressure was ultimately put to me, but we survived. <laughs> so due to the precious nature of this work, no two days were the same. A typical day consisted of working from half eight to half four. But as if the babies are so unpredictable, these can change in an instant. And we had to work around suiting the needs of the babies and doing night shifts and being on call when necessary. The values and beliefs of the Butterfly Home is that every child's life is valuable no matter how long or short and is not dependent on what they can contribute to society and that every child is worth love and care and to feel safe, wanted and affirmed throughout their lifetime. And also that every dying baby or child should be loved and cherished and die loved and with dignity. Every child should be given the opportunities and help to achieve their full potential. And then again, given information, support and choices, giving the parents the opportunity not to abandon their child and to give them the support they need. The organization works in cooperation with the Chinese government to establish models of children's palliative and hospice care that are sustainable, promoting the concept that every life is a gift and valuable. So the question that most people ask is why are the babies abandoned? And abandonment is endemic in the history of China and it's evidence in society today. Mainly the one child policy is the reason why they're abandoned, that they can only have one baby and they want their babies to be perfect and mostly they want the boys so their name can carry on. But also it's like deeply rooted suspicion is to blame. Superstition is to blame in that the parents believe that they've done something wrong in the past or that the child is going to bring them bad luck for their family and that's why they've been given a sick child. The other thing is the poverty. The poverty in Changsha, which is where the butterfly hospice is, is just indescribable. They have very poor income and little access to health insurance. Access to health care is limited and very expensive, so even a relatively minor health problem can bring a disproportionate pressure on the family budget. There's no official statistics kept, but currently it's thought there are upwards of 800 children abandoned in Changsha alone. Their ex medical care is very expensive and there's no set cost so you can go into a hospital and be told that it costs X amount of money and then the next day they'll just keep charging higher and higher. So even if they think it could be relatively cheap at the beginning, they always find a reason to increase the prices. The babies suffer from a wide variety of conditions and illnesses in the hospital. Each baby has their own unique needs and has their own unique needs and requires special nursing care ranging from basic colostomy care to caring for a premature infant with limited resources to caring for those with complex genetic disorders and those with liver failure. Some of the conditions are caused by poor health care, such as untreated meningitis, or even simple things like untreated febrile convulsions leading to brain damage. Another gray area with the Chinese healthcare system is to do with operations. And they might open up a baby and think, there's nothing really they can do and they'll either take something out or just close them back up again. So sometimes the children that are abandoned, you've no idea what operations they've had or what, what really was the problem in the first place. The saddest abandonments, however, are of the older children. These children have clearly been loved and well cared for, but as they're becoming bigger and more difficult to care for, their, and their health is deteriorating, it's very expensive, so the family feel forced to abandon the child. So how do the babies come to the Butterfly Hospice? There's a hospital next door to the hospice where the babies get abandoned, and or sometimes the babies can get abandoned on the side of a road, or in another hospital, their parents will just leave them. So then the police will bring them to the hospital. However, the hospital is a far cry from a Western hospital. In the hospital, the children can share wooden cots or pens, and many of them don't have clothes. 
there's about one nurse to maybe 10 babies and they don't have any medical equipment. Everything is washed and reused and medicine, they'll get medicine if they're lucky. The sight in the hospital will stay with me forever. The look of lost fear and hope, in, lack of hope in their eyes is heartbreaking. So essentially we will go and pick a baby who looks the sickest or who we think is dying. It is heartbreaking to know you can't help every baby and take every child out of that desperate situation. The other time that we would get a baby is when the welfare centre would ring the hospice to say there's a baby in the hospital who needs urgent medical attention. So maybe they'd have a burst abdomen or they might need heart surgery. So there is hope and there is chance, but the hospital can't afford to give these babies a second chance. So that's why they'd ring and say, can you take them and fund for them to go and get surgery? As I said before, pediatric surgery in China is another gray area. The health system is based on tips and gifts for the doctors and is very more money orientated. They don't see the child as a whole and some children come back looking as if they've been butchered. The bottom picture here is of a boy who, that was pretty much post colostomy. Um, usually the children go, whenever we take them, they go to Shanghai, Beijing or Hong Kong to have the best chance for surgery. The only problem with Hong Kong is that they're going outside of the country, so they have to have a passport. And as these babies have no identity, nothing, that you might think it's a problem, but you can just give them a piece of paper with any baby's name and they'll let you take them. Each butterfly is inspirational and they all have their own story to tell. My journey has been an emotional roller coaster with highs and lows along the way. There were numerous challenges that I faced along the way. In particular, it's more that there was three nurses. We had medical assistance from the hospital next door, but we were the ones where the decisions lay at the end of the day. We had a little girl called Amy who was suffering from long-term seizures from febrile convulsions that were left untreated. And she was on oxygen the last few days of her life and we were just holding her every day, allowing her comfort at the end of life. But the difficult decision we had to make was knowing when to switch off the oxygen and how do you explain to the IE who care for the baby that it's in their best interest, that she's not going to get better. And you have to kind of make the nannies understand that she won't get better, so we have to let her go peacefully. So things like that were very difficult to understand ourselves and then to have to explain to somebody else with a low level of education. See, feeling the pain and heartbreak, seeing these fragile lives crumble before your eyes, like baby Max who passed away peacefully less than 24 hours after he arrived in Butterfly, was heartbreaking. The other thing that we had to help the nannies cope with was when the babies got adopted, the f their feelings of loss and detachment. Because although they're going on to have a happy life with their forever families, the nannies sometimes found this more difficult that they would never see these babies again, even though they knew they'd grow up to be in a much better situation than they would have been in. One of the most frustrating and heartbreaking times was when we got a new baby from the orphanage. The babies come with no medical history, no diagnosis, no identity, no name. These babies have suffered horrendous losses and abandonment and received pure emotional and physical neglect, never knowing what cuddles were or having the ability to bond and attach. Many of them had given up and been left to die from depression alone. The look of emptiness and hurt in their eyes was heartbreaking. This little boy, we went over because they rang and said that he was dying of liver failure. So when we went over, we did a full assessment of him. He was all wrapped up in his clothes. And I asked the doctor, I just said, can I open his baby throat? And he said, yeah, yeah, no problem. And he had a wound, a bandage over his scar here. And I asked, oh, what's that? Oh, we never got a chance to look. So when we opened then we realized that he'd had surgery and it wasn't successful. We sent him to get ultrasounds and scans done and basically it opened him up, taken out his liver and he passed away 24 hours after we came to Butterfly. In the Butterfly home, the babies receive everything a human being deserves. Love, support, the best medical care available and a family to call their own. I and the other nurses love these butterflies but more importantly we help the nannies to love the babies. Some babies died in the nurses' and nannies' arms as we gave them the pain relief they needed. Some babies have had major life-changing surgery, 
and other babies just needed some love and a reason to survive. And some of these children have got a second chance and been adopted. For the little bu butterflies where there was no hope, we loved and cared for them as they passed away peacefully and comfortably. When they come to butterfly, we give them a name, love, support and hope and a family of their own. Sometimes there's nothing more we can do for them, but at least they die comfortably and their life matters. This was a little baby Robin. The first time I saw her, I knew I couldn't leave her. She was lying in the, in the hospital, just in a cot forgotten about in the corner. She was lying there struggling to breathe, her tiny bird-like face sighing out in respiratory distress, and I knew I had to hold her. We, hold her we held her close each day and ensured she was comfortable as she died. She passed away four days after she came to us. The only consolation was after we got her x-ray results back, it showed she had congenital lung emphysema and even with the best medical care, she was never going to survive. This little boy, Mark, is currently receiving palliative care in the hospice. He came to us on the 4th of May and he had a life expectancy of about a week. So we cared for him and gave him quality palliative care. So he's still alive now, but you have to wonder what kind of quality of life he has. He has constant seizures and no medication is controlling them. He remains in a decerebral position and slowly deteriorates every day. The doctors think with him that he had meningitis that was never treated and subsequently his brain was severely damaged and he's now in the brain stem destruction and coney phase. We feed him with an NG tube. We stopped feeding him for a while, thinking that maybe we were prolonging his life by feeding him NG. The nannies couldn't understand why we were doing this, and when he fought through, we decided to put the NG tube back down so the nannies feel like they're doing something for him and providing him with some comfort. So all we can do for him is just ensure he is as good seizure control as possible and good, pa good pain control. There's talk maybe he'd benefit from a palliative shunt, but in China, the doctors are too reluctant to touch him in case something goes wrong, because then they have a death on their hands. This little boy, Michael, was the boy who has the scar from the colostomy. The day he arrived, he was a bright, smiley little boy, and nothing has changed since. He had two previous failed surgeries for an imperfect anus and had horrific scarring. He had rec rectal fistulas and a large fistula between his bowel and bladder. He went to Beijing for surgery after we got him and came back with a colostomy. Initially, there was no complications or abnormalities seen on our first assessment. That night, we got a call from the nannies to say Michael wasn't good. With the language barriers, it was difficult to decipher what was wrong, but nothing could prepare us for what we were about to face when we went in. The sights and experiences I have had in that Chinese hospital will stay with me forever. Blood on the floor, dirty surfaces and bed sheets, people sleeping on the floor. As I said, the Chinese medical system is all based on tips, so when they see foreigners, they try to charge more. The doctors had no English, so we had to try and explain what was wrong with this little boy. The biggest fear is we didn't know what they would do. Would they resect his bowel and hope for the best, or would they return all of his organs? Handing Michael over to theater was the hardest thing I ever had to do. No consent forms had to be signed, no documentation had to be filled in, just all we did was hand him over. Sitting outside the operating theater was the hardest thing I ever had to do. I now appreciate how difficult it is for parents waiting for their children during surgery. Post-operative care is non-existent over there. There's no recovery room. Michael came straight out of hospital and was handed to me. The doctor told us if his lips turned blue or he stopped breathing to call a nurse or else the doctor would see him in the morning. Here he would no doubt be in an ICU with the best medical care, whereas there we were sent back to an open six-bedded ward. He had drains, catheters, NG tubes, wound drains, IV lines in situ. All we could do was sit beside him for the night and hope for the best. He was so lifeless and hearing him cry knowing we couldn't pick him up was horrible. He was like that for 12 days, lying on the bed, his arms in splints, not being allowed to be picked up, eat, or cuddled. He went from strength to strength, and despite all the odds, he continued to fight. He was in hospital for 15 days following his complications, and then we got our bouncy bo baby boy back to Butterfly Hospice. He has suffered continuous complications since then and had recurrent fistulas between his bladder and bowel. He's since been for more surgery in Beijing and somehow remains 
of beef showing amazing determination and courage. So at the moment he's waiting to be adopted so that he can get better health care and better medical care elsewhere. Palliative care provided here in Ireland is much more advanced due to advanced health care and funding. It is difficult to adjust at first to the different customs, washing and reusing syringes and medicine bottles, the lack of resources, medication and equipment, and learning to nurse with little resources. Little Teddy only stayed with us for 23 hours. Once again, no diagnosis. All we could do was ensure he was warm, comfortable and loved. Even now, we still don't know what was wrong with him. The hardest part is when a baby dies. We wash the baby, dress the baby, place a butterfly toy in their hands and wrap them in a blanket. The undertaker comes, wraps them in a plastic sheet and ties them in a parcel and takes them away. Sometimes the undertakers will be nice, but other times they treat them like a shopping bag and will just drag them out the door. Of course, as well as all the challenging times, there have been rewarding and uplifting moments each day which balance out with the struggle and challenges. Life is never quiet in the butterfly home. When you walk through the door, the first thing you hear is laughter, followed by the pitter-patter of feet with the butterflies running up with their ar arms open, ready to be cuddled and showered with affection. Watching the babies grow is inspiring, from seeing them take their first steps, saying their first words, celebrating their first birthdays, or seeing them start play school is beautiful. It's made me appreciate how fragile life can be and to make the most of every opportunity. When Finley arrived in December 2011, he came with inoperable heart surgery and came to die. Such a simple operation over here, over there, they class it as inoperable. Surgeons have previously said there was no hope for him and he needed palliative care. As with all babies when they come to Butterfly Hospice, they fight for a second chance for each baby and do the best they can. Because little Finley got hope and a second chance, a surgeon in Shanghai agreed to operate him and through a lot of tender love and care from his nannies and nurses, he survived. Now there's no stopping him. When I first arrived in May, he was a shy, timid boy in the corner. He's gone from a shy, quiet little boy, afraid of everything, to a bouncy boy full of life and energy. He's on the list for adoption now. He's growing bigger every day. He started to walk and is now running around and can start to talk. He started play school in October and he's just a completely different child than what he was. When the babies come to the Butterfly Hospice, we make them a life book, a story of their own. In here, we detail their hospital records, their handprints, any information we have about them, which is what, what they can take with them when they're adopted so they do have a past and they do have a beginning. Here on the left is a love letter, which is what all the people who care from him, all the nannies, the nurses, any volunteers who come, they all write down their memories of the baby. And then they all go inside a book, along with photos, photos of their other butterflies who would have been their brothers and sisters, so to say. And they would bring this with them then when they get adopted. Since the little boy down here, Paul, he got adopted in May. And since then, the mum says that every day he looks at his book and points at all his friends in the photographs. The next little girl, Zoe, she came to us and she only weighed 1.1 kilo. She, when they rang, they said she was going to die. She's born premature, unknown gestation. They guessed about 28 to 30 weeks. When she arrived, she was hyperthermic and her temperature, we couldn't even read it on a thermometer. She was so fragile and had thin, so skin, she looked like she would break if you held her. I have personally never seen a baby this size, except for in the neonatal unit in the Rotunda Hospital. So to me, I was quite surprised. So yeah, what surprised me the most is that here, she'd be in a neonatal ICU with all the latest high-tech medical equipment to give her the best chance at life. Here we do, in China, we did not have these luxuries. The best we could do was nurse her in a quiet, warm, loving environment and hope for the best. We didn't have luxuries of incubators. All we could do was keep her on a warming blanket, wrap her up warm, and use kangaroo care for the first few weeks. Miraculously, she's putting on weight and doing very well. Luckily, she had a suck reflex, and she started feeding slowly nine mils every three hours because we didn't have an NG tube small enough to feed her. So, this little girl is a fighter. She's going from strength to strength, and she now weighs four kilos. She, although, she is, although she was born very premature, she doesn't show any signs of slowing down. With regards to her development, she started smiling, and although she remains physically smaller than a baby her size, she is meeting her developmental milestones. 
It's amazing what basic nursing care and love can do to the child at the start of life. So after washing and reusing syringes and recycling disposable gloves, I truly realized that even though I was in China, a perceived wealthy country, I truly was in the third world. It is true that in countries such as China, who have an ever-increasing export trade, the rich continue to get richer, and sadly the poor are the ones who suffer and continue to struggle. The government has implemented policies to improve the infrastructure of the country, including its health and social welfare system. But against a background of ingrained and acceptable corruption at all levels, it is recognised that it will take many years to improve. In 2008, the Chinese government approved a policy of positive working with non-governmental organisations, directing provincial officials to make every attempt to accept offers of help from foreign charities and work together in partnership in order to learn and emulate good systems of social welfare. There are so many unbelievable opportunities to use the skills, training and knowledge we get in Trinity College. The Butterfly Children's Hospice in China is just one of these places that can use the help. I would encourage anyone to get out there, to take time out, even for a short while, to experience a different healthcare setting. I've learned a huge amount, both professionally and personally, and I've had to face some extremely different challenges, but at the same time, it's been the most rewarding experience of my life, and seeing the smiles on the baby's faces makes it all worth it. I'd go back tomorrow. Working in the Butterfly Home is a fantastic opportunity, and allows you to be part of a great team making a positive difference to these babies' lives. So, who knows what the future holds? Any questions? Anybody like to ask Katie anything? Yeah. <laughs> Eleanor. Yeah, no, it was really hard leaving, but I left with the thought that I'm going to go back. So it wasn't a goodbye, more of just, I'll come home and then come back. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> yeah. Maria? a bit but you wouldn't really reckon it, you know it's more that yeah you wouldn't really see it in the place yeah outside the country yeah 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 there well the six they've had have all been international adoptions anybody else Agnes? Yeah, it's all donations. Like before I went, I raised a good bit of money and brought out simple antibiotics like augment and like painkillers, Haldol, Nurofen, everything. And likewise, so when we got Michael back with his colostomy, we just kind of go and for the first while, he had added colostomy bags, so they were nearly bigger than him. But you just make do with what you have. No, they were just two. She was a nurse who worked in England for many years, and now she's retired and went out there to set up this organization. She'd been out to China a few times on voluntary kind of short projects, but now she's out there full time. <laughs> Yeah. See, it depends. Over there, you don't know what drugs you're buying, even though it says something on the box. It might be what it says on the inside. So mostly, like, they people from a foreign country would chip them in.
Yeah. Yeah, and all the Chinese people who I've spoken to about why, because it takes some of the babies are waiting two and a half years, by which stage they're four and five, so they know like that that's their family and these are all their brothers and sisters. So it's hard for them then to move on. But the people, the Chinese that I spoke to said that China's embarrassed. So that's why it's such a long process and it's so expensive and takes so long because they don't want people thinking, oh, we'll just, yeah. Right, you see. See, so the hospital next door doesn't do any pediatric surgery. They purely just take the babies and look after them. There is one children's hospice or hospital down the road from where the hospice was, which is supposed to be the best children's hospice in the area. But that's not saying a lot. And then so when we send them up near Beijing for surgery, the hospitals get better, but it's still not the same standards you'd have over here. And even then, like if, so when, his, when Michael's stoma prolapsed and we rang the doctor, oh, you must have done something wrong. Everything's about blaming someone else and mm -hmm. it's not what we did because we did it perfectly. And then eventually it will come out and then I know maybe we didn't fix him properly. and Because twice he's come back now and suffer complications and has to go back into hospital. Lena. No, when you're in, when you're there, you just kind of get on with it. And like the first baby, when the first baby died, I just thought it was the end of the world and it was just horrible. But then when you look around and the nannies look to you to be strong and to show them how to cope, because once the baby dies, like the nannies go hard, they won't talk about it because they feel as if they're to blame because it was on their shift. Even if the baby was dying, the nannies feel then that it was their fault and they did something wrong and even when we got baby Teddy and like there was nothing we could do for him they couldn't understand why we wouldn't put an NG tube down and feed him so that like like we did with Mark they just can't understand the concept of not trying every single thing even if it means he'll be in more pain they just think well why can't every child get better but so then not to yeah after the first time then it was difficult. And then as you get on, like, you just know that sometimes these babies are going to a better place and there's no, like, they're not comfortable how they are and they're in so much pain and agony that they have to let go. So you just, accept, not accept it, but, you know, you find it easier to let go if, because some of them, like, they're in such a spiritual distress and so much pain and seizures all the time that when they're finally, passed away like they look at peace and they look comfortable. Yeah. Yeah, that was it, like no incubator, nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And like Yeah, of just the basics, yeah. And even because we had to try and keep the other babies away, but sure, they were like, oh, you know, wanting to have a look and see <laughs> why she's so small. <laughs> yeah. And now, like, so she's flying along. <laughs> so you're hoping to go back? Yeah. I'm not sure when. Okay. I'm working at the moment to get money together and then hopefully... And do you think 
would you would you approach the work any differently going back now, or would it be the same? I'll become less attached. Because at the beginning I was so attached and I was bringing my mum being like, oh mum, do you want to adopt a baby? Can I bring one home? And, <laughs> you know, and she was like, no way. Yeah. But I don't know, I suppose you have to get attached as well mm. to be able yeah. to give them the to care them, and yeah. the love. Yeah. 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 yeah, in a paediatric surgical unit. <laughs> it's just it's just so difficult and even you know you're waiting and asking a doctor over and over again can you prescribe me Calvol can you prescribe me Calvol everything whereas over there like you're giving so much more than Calvol and you just have to know that it's you know check the doses check everything and give as best you can so over here now I'm like you know double and triple checking everything <laughs> And that's the thing, like over there, say we had one of the girls with the kidney infection. And, you know, you think the antibiotics you would use here, and then it's like, no, we don't have them. So you're literally like just shooting in the dark. Yeah. Yeah, it's nearly worse coming back. And more so that, you know, because we were living in what was called like luxury accommodation, but we had a few furry friends and everything else just to keep us company. And then coming back here now and, you know, other people, you just take everything for granted, like for granted and you don't realize it. Mm. And then even stuff like the food, it's just everything's completely different. And you come back and you caught water because we had no hot water. So you come back to hot water and it's just out of this world and you're trying to explain to people who don't have like a medical background I'm sure they're just lost you know they're like mm. <laughs> blown away by it all Louise I think it is yeah <laughs> coming back Yeah, see, I did think about going on to do medicine and then going back as a doctor so you could help even more. Mm. So, but at the moment, I'm just focusing on improving my clinical skills and then we'll see where I go from there. <laughs> no, I'm in Mount Carmel at the moment on the, the pediatric surgical unit. So, busy enough, I suppose. <laughs> Claire? Like there's not a lot, like there's, yeah, not a lot of help at all. And even like, sure, we only at the moment, it was only a 14, sometimes 15 bed unit, depending on how many mortgages were in. But, <laughs> you know, and then uh, there's a few other organizations in the area that we were. But funny you mentioned the older people in the building beside us, it was all the elderly who've just been, yeah. And so like you'd see the elderly out in the playground and then the kids beside them. And it's sad to think that 
like the older people have been part of someone's family, just like the children were, but they might have been there for 60 years mm -hmm. and then they realise, you know, well, you can't contribute anything anymore, so we'll just put you back. And it's a whole circle mm -hmm. that you're back to where you started, basically. And the poverty as well, because I remember one time we went into the hospital and there was two kids in the same bed, one was eight and one was ten. And I said to the nurse, I was like, why are, like, you know, what's wrong with these? And she was like, oh, they were too expensive. Their parents just brought them here because they knew here they'd get a bed and clothes and food. So. <laughs> And even with the formula milk, like they won't use, because of the whole controversy with the milk was all filled with, you know, yeah. So even the milk and everything, if you go out to Hong Kong, you can only bring in one can of milk into China. so like quick and easy and no yeah and it's more just that if they don't know what to do they'll just yeah yeah and just hope for the best really yeah that's the thing you see yeah that they don't even make it anywhere they just slip under the radar Yeah. <coughs> yeah. It's to leave them, yeah. And Yeah, and that's why, because they're trying to expand it to a community palliative care service, but there's such taboos and stigma of dying children in a community that the whole family would be shunned. So, you know, they just think it's better to let the child go. Not really, no. Like the only, we only, I only had one experience, luckily, with the Chinese hospital, because then the whole time it was just the three nurses working then in the hospice with kind of input from the welfare centre. But like the one experience I had in the hospital of the Chinese healthcare system, like I wouldn't put myself or like my pet in a hospital. You know, like I just wouldn't <laughs> leave anyone there. Yeah, that's the first thing you do is you just have to pay money. Like they don't ask you for your name, your anything, just pay money. Yeah. And then even that's like you pay for painkillers, you pay for everything. So they'll come around, oh, do you want painkillers? And you're like, okay, you know, thinking he's in pain, so that's the natural thing. And they'll say, oh, okay, that's however amount of money. Yeah. And then, because even when we were in the hospital, there was a girl beside us in the bed with her little boy, and he had two chest strains in, and she's like, I can't afford to pay for any of this. Do you know, and she was like, oh, because obviously she said, that's not your baby. And I was like, no, you know, and we kind of explained what we were doing or whatever. So like, do you know, all we could do was bring her clothes, bring her nappies and stuff to help her out in some way. 
but it's nearly a vicious cycle because you wonder then what's going to happen mm -hmm. at the end of his treatment when she can't mm -hmm. pay the bill, yeah. All right, I think we end there and I think just on behalf of everyone, <laughs> on behalf of everyone, thank you for a really, really moving presentation and I think you deserve more than Katie Taylor <laughs> in terms of a gold medal. I think, I think you're a wonderful person to have done that and it's lovely to think that you spent time here in Trinity and hopefully took some of the skills yeah, from definitely. here out to China and you couldn't have taken it to a better place. So thank, thank you very thank much. Thank you for coming. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.